Hi, I am Srini Srinivasan from Aerospike. Welcome to another Scale Warrior webinar. Our guest today is Ted Wallace. Ted is currently VP of Data Delivery at Blue Kai and also a veteran from Amazon with over a week, decade of experience in various critical roles. Our discussion today will focus on how Blue Kai scaled to 10 trillion data transactions a month. Ted? Thanks, Srini. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk to you about what we do at Blue Kai and how we use Aerospike. And Blue Kai, for those of you who don't know us, is uh, big data for marketing. So we provide the most effective platform for bringing in data from multiple sources like CRM, uh, online, mobile, and activate, uh, unlocking the value in that data through detailed analytics and, and granular permissioning, and then activating that data to any execution platform on any channel or in any device. And many of the biggest brands in the world use us for their data-driven marketing, and we operate at a significant scale for what is or was a small company. Uh, we do about 10 trillion data transactions outward each month uh, off of an inbound request volume of about 10 billion requests per day. And we have experience across a wide variety of elements of the online advertising ecosystem. So we've built a, a first big data exchange. We are working pioneering cookie list uh, options for gathering data on devices that don't support cookies. And we serve people across retail, finance, etc. So what does it mean to be big data for marketing? What it really means is that we take data in from a variety of sources, wherever a marketer may have sources, like their CRM database or their website. We bring that in and then we enable them to unlock that value through analytics and permissioning. And then based off of what they're saying or what they want, we send that data out. So by way of example, uh, a large computer provider can say, hey, uh, let me know all the people who have been browsing laptops on my website uh, that I also already know own a desktop, and maybe I can send them a special deal or interact with them in a special way uh, through Facebook or, or Twitter or on their mobile device so that I can ensure that when they are actually going to buy a laptop, they come to me and they buy that laptop. Uh, and that, that is my, uh, my sales and marketing presentation. Uh, so next up is, oops, oh, sorry, one more slide, which is, does this actually work? And the short answer is, the response from our customers is that absolutely it works. Uh, we get big impact on return on advertising spending. We increase click-through rate. We reduce cost per action. Uh, and this has been measured by our customers directly. So we're pretty excited by what we provide, and our customers are very excited by what it gives them. to the meat of it and the things where I'm certainly more comfortable talking is how does our system work and, and what's important here? And at the root level in this diagram, you see uh, customers put JavaScript on their websites uh, and that ingests data into our system through uh, calls directly to our pixel servers is what we call our front end servers. Those access a real time set of data stores run by uh, Aerospike and perform uh, targeting and delivery actions upon that, that data, and then record those in transactional logs that then go to our analytic systems. So that's at a very high level what happens. And we have to build this for both speed and scale. Speed is really important because we've got our JavaScript on customers' websites, and if we're slow and we slow down the, their customers' experience, uh, they're not going to be happy with us. And uh, as a result, our application, which includes both a read and a write to Aerospike, has to finish very, very quickly, and that usually happens within about 25 milliseconds. And we have to operate at scale. We are not uh, given the luxury of just being uh, kind of an aggregated service. We instead have to scale with the traffic of everybody's websites that we are a part of. And so the traffic winds up being additive. And so at our, at our peak, we, we serve well over 100,000 requests per second, which gets us to just shy of about 10 billion requests each day. And we have well over uh, 10 terabytes of data in our, in our real-time data stores as we cover end-user data across desktop, mobile, and the world. So where is Aerospike in all this? Aerospike sits in the middle of this diagram on the left where we have our pixel servers and our profile stores. 
So our pixel servers are the key, in fact, the only client of our profile stores, which is our Aerospike uh, clusters. And those profile stores hold uh, the detailed information, the tags, and you know, where we've sent data for each of our active customers. These are our real-time snapshots, so they're correct for any moment in time. Um, we don't currently store history in our profile stores, and we use our analytics clusters to help us understand what has been happening historically. From an uh, Aerospike perspective with Blue Chi, uh, every single customer interaction is super critical to us, and Aerospike is on the front line of those interactions every second. And we store our customer data across six different clusters uh, be with between six and ten servers in each of those clusters in geographically distributed data centers. Our average read-write times from Aerospike are on the order of one to two milliseconds. And we have found that when it's higher, it's not Aerospike's fault. It's because our client load is high or we're experiencing a lot of fun with networking. And that's always a real joy to, to debug. From a data volume perspective, I've already mentioned that we're over 10 terabytes of data inside our Aerospike clusters. Uh, and we have over 21 billion entries in each of our batch ingest database clusters. So, uh, that's a lot of data, and we need a system that can not only ingest and index and understand that data, but allow us to, to get that data super quickly, and Aerospike really delivers on that one. And from a hardware perspective, for those of you interested, uh, it's pretty standard Linux hardware. We don't have super exciting stuff here, uh, which is awesome. Like We don't have to be very specialized. Um, we do use SSD-backed uh, drives so that our data volumes can, can have high IOPS. Um, but that's, that's as exotic as it gets, uh, and it works super well. And that is my super quick overview on what we do. Uh, I'm going to go back to this slide uh, so that uh, we can have uh, some questions and comments from Srini. Um, thank you, Ted. Um, this is Srini again. Uh, I have here with me Brian, uh, who is CTO of Aerospike. And Brian and I um, will ask a few questions and maybe have a little discussion here. Um, the great. first question, yeah, thank you. The first question I have is, um, you talked about, you know, in, in your picture here, you have, um, you know, the the online database, you know, what, what do you, you know, you use Aerospike for that, but then you also have analytics and data warehouse. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of um, wondering, how does data move between your real-time database systems like Aerospike to more batch-oriented systems like Hadoop and vice versa? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. So. The, the key interface and the only interface into Aerospike is our pixel servers. Um, and when we want to move data basically out of Aerospike into our analytics systems, we use the pixel servers to create a transactional log that's ingested by our analytics uh, services. And so that, uh, the key mechanism there is through basically our, our web server, and um, that, that moves the data in a time-delayed fashion out to those systems. When we've done a bunch of analytics, let's say our data science team has figured out something particularly interesting and wants to create a new mapping or, or help identify the quality of some of the data that we have, what they'll do is they'll create um, a file that we then ingest through the same mechanisms that we ingest CRM data or other batch data from our customers, and we pull that directly into what we call our offline data store, which is also run by Aerospike. And it sits there, and then we have a process that copies that data into the real-time data store, either when we see the user or over the course of a day. That way we can ingest lots of offline or batch data into the real-time system without necessarily getting in the way or without having to touch that data system directly. So it, it keeps things super efficient and super tight from our perspective. Uh, we don't okay, have thank you. or permit any other kind of direct connectivity into the Aerospike because, honestly, it's our most important system to keep things running, and uh, we like to keep that really, really tightly controlled. So, uh, uh, cool, Ted. So, um, maybe uh, can you tell me a little bit about sort of the uh, early days of uh, uh, building up Blue Chi? Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I hear people say, well, you know, uh, all of that scale is well and good, but, you know, maybe I don't need it now. So, um, you know, as you were thinking about growing the business uh, in the early days, uh, uh, what were some of your uh, choice points uh, to, to, uh, in, in choosing this uh, storage layer? 
Sure. Well, when first when Blue Tie first got going, uh, we just stored all this data in cookies um, because you know why have a big expense or hassle of having a centralized database when you can just distribute the storage all into a cookie space. Uh, and then there's a couple things that get in the way of that. Uh, one, when all your data is stored out in the cookie space, you can't act on it unless you see that customer again. Uh, so uh, if you have somebody who is maybe infrequently showing up on your network where you have coverage, uh, but might be uh, a common user somewhere else, you're limiting your ability to get data out to that user or about that user that's useful. So that's one of the, the key early decisions that we, we had made that we were thinking about how do we fix this? How do we create a profile store? Um, another downside is that cookies, they've got a limitation to the, how much storage they have. They, I think 4K is the cookie limit these days. Um, and so you can only store so much data in a cookie. So uh, that worked for us reasonably well early on when we were primarily a data exchange. But as we added the data management platform capabilities to our, to our tool set, um, and we had really a, a large proliferation of data, we had this need that we wanted to be able to perform uh, more actions on centralized customer data, and we just didn't have it. So we needed to figure it out and go get it. So okay, we need a database. And we thought to ourselves, uh, what about a relations database? And thought to ourselves, well, to try and keep our speeds and feeds really, really fast, a relational database has a lot of nice stuff to it to, for analytics, but not really an awesome choice for what we think we want to do. We think we'd rather have something that, that is more in memory or, or just runs faster. And so NoSQL was a really good choice for us. Uh, and probably like most people, when we first thought NoSQL, uh, oh, uh, Cassandra, that's what people use for NoSQL. So uh, we spun up a Cassandra cluster and, and we played with that for, I want to say about six months. It, it frankly is before my time, so, so I have some history on that one. but. Uh, we played for it with a while and, and ultimately found out that to do Cassandra well, and I think this has been found out by a lot of people, you need people who are focused on keeping Cassandra alive and running, which, which is great and works well for some companies. I think Netflix, for example, is a huge Cassandra uh, user. Uh, but we didn't want to invest in creating a team of Cassandra whisperers. We, we didn't want to be experts at managing Cassandra. And, this, I think, predated when you know, people were making things more readily available. Uh, and so it was obvious to us we needed something better. And when we looked at Aerospike, we talked to uh, you know, folks like Serena and Brian, and, and we found out, hey, these are people who think like we think. They think about simplicity, they think about scale, and they think about performance. And those three things go super well together. And when we talked about how they built their system, we got answers that made our engineers say, well, you know, if, if I had to go build something like that, that might be what I would choose to do. So, hey, here's this great set of people who've done this. Um, let's rely on their technology. And I think I've lost the original thought on the question, Brian, but, but the short answer is we, we, we found the need to have a centralized data store. We needed it to be performant. We didn't want to become experts at operating databases. Uh, and Aerospike was, the, was a great product for us, was the perfect product for us. It, it slotted right in, and it provided immediate value to us. And, and because we have that centralized profile store, we have a lot more flexibility in what we can do with customer data to the advantages of our customers. Uh, great. Uh, thanks. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the SLAs you actually offer to your customers? Because, you know, um, in terms of talking about speed, uh, speed and reliability, um, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we, we lose some of the detail about, you know, how important uh, reliability is between you and your customers. Sure. Reliability is very important. Um, so while we, we deal with reliability in a couple different ways, and, and mostly our tag is um, – is implemented inside of an iframe so that if we are having problems, it doesn't interfere with a customer's website. Um, we found that as our use cases move on to things like uh, site site optimization and, and other things, we become more in line and a, a more of a dependency on the performance of their website. So when you do that, even though you, you can claim that for the vast majority of use cases, uh, you know, e even if we're really terrible, the iframe protects them, uh, it, it doesn't always protect them. And so, so reliability is, is important. We offer, uh, I think, a, a three nines uptime guarantee is our, is our core externally facing SLA for, for tag serving. Uh, and we strive to try and make sure it doesn't go below three nines five. 
Um, and we measure that and, and take points against ourselves pretty aggressively through an external measurement platform, something like Keynote or Catchpoint or something like that. Um, and we count very minor things against our, our SLA so that we take a very conservative view on that. So even if, by way of example, we get a, a single data probe in a five-minute period that has a failure, uh, perhaps because of its local network, or, or maybe we had a server that just exploded at that time, mm -hmm. uh, we'll count that against our availability, even though you know our other 800 servers are up and running just fine. So, uh, so we count three nines as our as our target, and, and we're pretty uh, conservative about what we call availability. From a performance perspective, um, we internally uh, try to make sure our average performance stays well below 50 milliseconds. And this is, you know, typically measured as wait time in an external uh, measurement platform, and externally. Our SLAs are around 200 to 300 milliseconds on average um, to allow us some leeway with the vagaries of the Internet and DNS. Uh, but we personally strive to keep our averages uh, below 100 milliseconds and because that's, that's where people would rather see it and that's where we'd like for it to be. Okay. Um, thanks, Ted. I have um, a question on... Um your Amazon experience, uh, I know you spend a lot of time on Amazon. Do you use um, Amazon Web Services, I mean EC2 or whatever, for your any of your services today in BluePie? Yes, we do. Uh, yeah, I was at Amazon for 12 years, and for four of them I uh, ran network engineering for AWS. So um, as a result, coming into BluePie, I probably had an unhealthy bias or maybe a healthy bias towards cloud-based solutions. Uh, having spent four years building them. Um, the, we use EC2 for some of our analytics and some of our log processing, and we also use EC2 for our test and development environments. Today, we don't use EC2 for any of our real-time servicing, and we don't actually run Aerospike inside AWS today. Okay. Is this something... Um, uh, you you are actively considering moving back and forth, or uh, as a backup maybe to run things on the cloud. Uh, well, what are your general so, thoughts on what what goes in a data center versus what goes on the cloud? So we actually run almost all of our systems in either the cloud or something kind of cloudy. Uh, so okay. we use AWS. Uh, our Aerospike stuff and our Pixel servers and our largest Hadoop cluster run inside SoftLayer. Uh, which is a uh, month to month bare metal. And so it's, it's cloudy ish without being totally cloudy. Um, but we definitely have thought about moving more stuff into AWS, especially as we've considered extending our footprint internationally. Um, now that we're part of uh, a larger organization that has a large global footprint. You know, we, we'll have to understand whether or not that still is the right step forward or if we can bring our stuff internally. Um, and, you know, usually the cloud's been really successful for us, and, and, and the key reason there is that building, owning, and operating a world-class infrastructure that's really available and has low latency to customers all over the U.S. and eventually all over the world, uh, th that is not an inexpensive option. And I have a great deal of respect for how much time, energy, creativity, and money it takes to do that well from my past life. And so I'm, I'm probably over-biased to rely on people who make it their core competency to, to do that, rather than think that somehow I can build a truly differentiating uh, competitive advantage by owning my own infrastructure. So from my perspective, mostly it gets to the point of, is this a... Is this a cost trade-off that makes sense? Like, does it make sense to pay, um, you know, somebody like Amazon for bandwidth in a way that might be more expensive than if I was just buying, you know, bandwidth from my own providers? And at some point, at scale, I could see where that cost trade-off does does skew towards owning your own stuff and bringing it in-house. Um, but I think that takes reasonably sized scale before it gets there. 
cool. So um, maybe we could talk a little bit about the application environment um, and the, inter the NoSQL interfaces. So that front edge uh, tier that you've been talking about for app servers, uh, what are you yep. using for uh, app server technology there and languages? Sure. Uh, so our Pixel servers are uh, cheap and cheerful pic Pixel, uh, sorry, pizza boxes, so uh, Linux servers uh, with, I think, a 3.4 or 3.5 gigahertz CPU in it, about 8 gigs of RAM, and, and not very much disk. Uh, our key interface into Aerospike is through an Apache um, module that we wrote in C and C++. And so we actually use Aerospike's, I think it's a C++ uh, client library uh, to, to hook in. And that, that core system is all written in C and C++. And, and how's that been, having maintaining that in C++? A lot of people are a little concerned about doing that tier at that, with that language. You know, it's a great question. Uh, the short answer is uh, it, it's working okay for us today. However, we're finding that it can be hard to find really highly talented, uh, capable sea monsters anymore. Like it's uh, finding, finding folks who can kind of deep into that level of performance and scale and understand uh, the system operations and be really great at C, like those are a set of characteristics that when you add them all together, it makes it hard to find really solid people there. So that's one of our challenges actually is making sure that that, that team's got the scale and capacity it needs from an engineering perspective. And so we, we are thinking about, you know, are there things that we can do that drive service-oriented architecture even deeper into that tier than we have today? So we can split out some things that, you know, maybe don't quite require, uh, you know, the performance or the, the particular surgical um, uh, detail that we have with C, and can we implement that in something else? Uh, you know, Java and Ruby are, are really popular with, with the back-end systems and the, the analytics systems here at Bukai. And, you know, you can find Java engineers just a little bit easier than you can find C engineers these days. Sure. So um, uh, in terms of the interfaces to uh, add Terra Spike and for that cookie lookup, uh, you know, mm -hmm. NoSQL is such a broad term in terms of interfaces. Uh, how did you find the, the interfaces that Aerospikes uh, offers for that and, and which components are you using? Um, that's a great question. I don't know that I know the interface components with the detail that we're using. Um, that said, our engineer who implemented them, uh, the, the interface found it super easy to do. Um, and I think we're using your C, C++ client library that we got from you guys. And uh, we're using some, some classic things like, you know, get and put type APIs. I think we've got a batch get that we use. And so uh, the actual implementation of that API was very, very straightforward for us. And it, it's not a place where we tend to have problems. So you know when you when you thought about relational or uh, Cassandra, uh, you didn't really go into any of the um, specific APIs for it, right? So one of your abilities to switch uh, to switch at that tier was by keeping to some simple key value paradigms. Absolutely, um, and so from a relational to Cassandra perspective, you know a large part of what drove that was you know, do we have the skill set to to maintain you know, a massive relational database, and even if we did, do we have the ability to make it perform like we want? We didn't think we'd, we could do that. Uh, and then when you thought about Cassandra, like that versus Aerospike, you have the same sort of questions, like do we have the skill sets to, to really build and maintain and, and keep a Cassandra cluster alive and happy, and do we want to invest in that? And, and we didn't. Um, and so with Aerospike, the, the key value lookup um, it's perfect for us because ultimately we do a lot of complex logic in our application itself. And so we keep the interface into to Aerospike very, very simple. Um, again, simplicity is, is scaled in a way that the complexity doesn't. Um, the, so when, when we get a user request in, we'll have a blue Kai ID as part of that request, and that's the key that we look up and comes back from that lookup is, is the full profile of the user. We get uh, some external IDs they may have mapped to. We get you know, what, what campaigns uh, they've won, so where their data has been sent that we need to track. 
And we use all that information in real time to understand, okay, do we need to add more information to this profile uh, because we received information from uh, the referring website. We went through a rules-based classification system to, to, to add to that profile. Once we've done that, we then need to ro run through targeting again and make sure that there haven't been new campaigns that re relate to either old data that the profile had or uh, any existing campaigns that relate to the new data. And if so, uh, we queue all that up for delivery and we put that into a, uh, a queue for a, another daemon to take care of. And then lastly, once we've done all that, we say, okay, so here's the new profile, here's uh, what it's won, put that back into the database, and then we just write that quickly back to the database. So we are using Aerospike as a very um, straightforward data store that's a key value pairs for us uh, precisely because to operate at the kind of scale we feel like we need to operate, we want to keep that very, very simple and very, very scalable. Cool. So um, in terms of, I know you guys use a lot of flash storage, right? And you guys were one of the early uh, users. You used uh, flash a lot on Cassandra as well. Uh, can yep. you talk a bit about, uh, first of all, the reliability of Flash, and then maybe a little bit about the economics? Sure. Uh, we found early on, so I think early on, was, especially with Cassandra, we had a lot of smaller Flash drives. Um, and we found that when you, you had had, like 20 of them in a box, right? Yeah, something Pretty like huge. There was some cra crazy number of 64 gig Flash drives. It was... And so when you start thinking about failure rates on it, so if you have 10 of those machines and you've got 20 64 gig flash drives, that's 200 flash drives, uh, and if, if you have a failure rate in a flash drive that's you know, 1 to 3% per year, you're talking about getting you know, a couple of failures every month, or every other month rather, so you, you're talking about a lot of overhead work. So early on we saw, we saw that kind of problem with our deployment. Um, and so we wound up skewing towards larger drives uh, and now have 800 gig drives and we have you know, a, a small handful of those in each of our machines. And we've certainly found over the course of the past two years, uh, reliability generally seems to be pretty good. Um, you know, they fail slightly more frequently than we've seen rotational fail in our deployments, but not with such alarming frequency that we spend a whole lot of time spinning in and out servers. Um, so we, we found both the performance to be great and the reliability to be pretty solid. From a and, uh, uh, which, which drives were those, uh, if, you, if you happen to have that at your fingertips? So we're using Intel's now. I'm trying to remember what we were using in those 64 gig ones uh, uh, back in the day, but I don't think I remember. Um, they may have been Intel drives as well. Yeah, I think they were. I think they were the earlier version of Intel drives. Well. Yeah. So, so you've yeah. definitely seen a, a uh, basically a, a solid reliability out of the Intels. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, they they work they work a treat. And not only are they not failing uh, when we perform things like the citrus leaf benchmarking against them, or, or just watch their general performance at a disk level, they're performing very nicely too. So, from an IOPS level, uh, they perform very consistently, very quickly. And that's not true of all SSDs. Absolutely. Um, so uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the economics of them. Good. Yeah, I was about to say, you asked about the economics. And um, we have found, you know, obviously our, our profile store boxes with SSDs, they're quite a bit more expensive than, you know, a pizza box that has, you know, a good fast CPU in it, a little rotational disk, and 8 gigs of RAM. Um, so it is something we have to think about. Um, on the flip side, um, if you were to move all that data into memory because you needed response times, uh, that would be crazy expensive. You know, uh, you're talking, I think you're talking on the order of a, a couple gig a dollar for SSDs. I'm trying to remember what it is. You know, it's uh, for our economics with, with uh, our provider. Um, versus, you know, five or six dollar or dollars a gig of memory. And so, um, as a result, the, the economics of doing it on SSDs versus memory are, are brain dead simple. So then the next question is, well, what about rotational? Like, could I accomplish this on rotational and keep my economics down? And the answer is, no, not really. Uh, because for rotational, if you want to do really well, you've got you've to go for uh, much higher IOPS. You're looking at uh, higher rotational disks that are more expensive. Um, and then you have to add enough of them so you've got uh, lots of spindles. 
And then even once you do that, your performance is just nowhere near as good. Uh, and we actually did an experiment where we moved our batch ingest systems off of SSD onto rotational because we thought, you know, this is a system where we look it up on a per customer basis something like once or twice a day. And so if, if one or two of your hits to us was 30 or 40 milliseconds worse than it would be ordinarily, that's probably not a huge deal, right? We can probably afford that. Uh, what we found was that when you're trying to ingest you know, billions of records of data every day into a system with rotational disk, you need so much rotational disk to keep on top of that ingest that it becomes super costly. And so we, we just couldn't keep up with rotational disk. We couldn't keep up with the amount of data we were trying to ingest from our customers uh, from a batch perspective. And so we had to go back to SSDs. And you know, it, so in the end, it saved us a little bit of money to be on rotational disks. But when we did that, we didn't have a system that kept up. And so in order to keep up, we were going to have to spend a lot more money. And once you do that math, it, it made a lot of sense just to stay on SSDs. Cool. OK, so I have a um, couple questions on different topics. One is, um, mm -hmm. I know your company has grown both in terms of the product usage and the team and so on. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about your experiences on, ex you know, on this hyper growth and especially focusing on a couple of learnings that you've had um, you know, as to what you have learned? For example, you know, have you learned how to do your business differently or better based on the real-time analytics or of big data analysis as everybody is now you know, working on, right? I mean, any thoughts and lessons learned would be good. So on a hyper-growth of people perspective, um, the, the biggest lessons learned there, especially in our systems around our real-time stuff, is figuring out um, how to make it so that people can be productive quickly um, we, we have a fairly complex, and by the way, we haven't solved that problem yet, but we have a fairly complex system. Um, there's a lot of nuance in digital advertising that maybe doesn't exist in other places. Uh, and so there's a lot to wrap your head around to be really effective in this space. So that, that's an area where uh, you know, a lesson learned for us is it sure would have been nice if when we, you know, had the luxury perhaps of a little bit more time, we had thought a little bit more about how do we bring people on board quickly, enable them to get really stuck in super well, and you know not need a direct connection into the chief architect's brain and to be super productive. Um, and we're better at that than we were, but it still is a bit of a slog to, to get up to speed in that space because it's just really complicated. So that, that's one of the lessons that I've learned but have not yet conquered from a uh, just growth in technology uh, perspective, uh, a lesson I've learned time and time again is that when you have to scale really fast, the things that scale most easily are the things that are very simple. And so um, when you have a complex system, it's like having a bunch of Legos that have been glued together. And it, it might work. Uh, but it brings a lot of extra crud along with it. Uh, and so uh, if, where, where you can have little individual Lego blocks that you're scaling individually, uh, you have a lot of freedom and a lot of ability to scale and drive uh, large volumes without risking your system's availability through complexity. You know, the, probably the way I think about this most readily is based somewhat in my past at Amazon where I was building a very, very big network, and every month it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, which was an exciting problem to have. But when you're using a network device uh, you know, that is designed to be used by perhaps a medium-sized business or in an enterprise data center or maybe as part of a cloud offering, as an IIS offering, that device and its software is going to have so much stuff in it that it has a lot of complexity just built into just using that device. And so even though you think you're using it in a way that is 
you know, reasonably deterministic for the outcomes you want, it can behave in ways that seem completely non-deterministic because of some complexity in a code path that that was, you know, added to to enable some edge case for small or home office or, or what have you that really has no bearing in, in your deployment except that it causes a nasty problem and, and it causes a, a lot of heartache for you and your staff in the middle of the night and then it causes a lot of heartache for you uh, when you have to talk to your boss the next morning. <laughs> so um, I was talking to, uh, we, we had a webinar with, uh, a meetup actually, with uh, one of your partner companies uh, that you work with closely, which is the Trade Desk. And they said one of the things about working with you guys that was such a pleasure was the fact that you had so much performance available on the front edge. So, so he said he always, it just created a better business relationship uh, between you guys. <clears throat> do, you, do you see that with a lot of folks, that you know, just having the ability to work uh, at scale in real time and handle a lot of peaks is just, just makes things work better? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, there's some pretty big names out there uh, who are our customers, and they have busy websites. And you know, when, when they come to us and they say, look, you, know, you might be adding something like 10,000 requests per second to you, and when we get to say, meh, that's, that's not a problem. I mean, that's, that's you know, 10% of our peak, so we'll have to watch it and, and pay attention, but we're not worried about it. And, and if, if you add a bunch of stuff and data to us, you know, within the next day, we can have more servers. Uh, and within the next day, we can add to our, our citrus leaf cluster, um, and it's not a, sorry, our aerospike cluster, uh, and it's not a big deal. Uh, that creates a certain level of comfort in your, in your clients. Um, and yet, the first couple times you say that, they're like, oh, you're just saying that. It's like, no, no, honestly, this is not a big deal. We can, we can handle this. Uh, I've got some graphs. I can prove it if, if I need to. Uh, and that creates a lot of comfort that they know. It's like, look, you know, if we get hit by a big flash audience or something, we know the blue guy is going to be up. It's going to handle it, and it's going to be okay. Yeah, uh, that's a great uh, point. And can you then talk about how important uh, operations are to the whole uh, process, I mean, the ease of operations in terms of running 24 by 7, you know, you just talked yeah. about adding capacity, upgrades, you know, can yeah. you talk a little bit about how the various products you've used helped you do it well or badly or whatever? Right. So uh, operations is very important. Um, the, I, I come from a, you know, a universe where operations every second of every day were of critical importance in the case of, you know, running the network for AWS. Um, and uh, you know, we used to have. Uh, we would talk a little bit about uh, a CPO metric from time to time, uh, and that would be customers pissed off. And you know, when you're operating at scale, even the slight mess up can have a very high CPO. And so you have to be really careful about everything you do in that universe. Coming into Blue Chi, the the tolerances aren't quite as tight as if I was running somebody else's network, uh, you know, some other business's network, um, but they're still really important. The, the data, the marketing data that our customers have is very important to them. They want it to get out to their execution platforms. They want information on what happened and why, and if we didn't send it out, why didn't we send it out? So getting into the nuts and bolts and the details and the metrics are, are super important. And it's hard to be a data-driven business and a data-driven company without the ability to dig into, analyze, understand, and operationalize your data. So that's, that's hugely important. With respect to technology that's made it easy or hard, uh, so far mostly we've made technology decisions that have made it easy. Um, again, in the case of uh, Aerospike, uh, when we need more capacity in our cluster, we get a machine ready and you add it to the cluster and then you step away. And you know, it just works. So that is very empowering and very, uh, you know, very uh, rewarding when you don't have to have somebody spend, you know, days creating, you know, a documented process so they can get a approvals. You don't have to send notification out to your customers that there's downtime because you have to do some massive database maintenance. Like, it just works. You just add it, it goes, and you move on. And we've done that repeatedly over the course of the past two and a half years, and it's always just worked a treat. So that's been awesome. And horizontal scaling like that is a critical component of achieving outrageous scale. And so, uh, you know, on the on the front end side, our app servers are web servers that are stateless. And so, 
it's a great place to be. When you have a bunch of stateless servers, you need more capacity, you add more servers, and you're good. And even on the analytics side, Hadoop uh, is a very horizontally scalable system. You know, if you need more disk or more CPU or more memory for your jobs, uh, you can just add more hardware. And yeah, it does take time for data to replicate across the cluster and, and do the right thing, but uh, when you build your core stuff off of horizontally scalable components, it makes scaling up super easily, uh, super easy. Interestingly, it also makes scaling down really easy, right? Um, we uh, when we did an architecture change on our front end servers, we were able to return about 30% of our hardware. And so, not only ha having the economic arrangement where we could do that was cool, which is one of the reasons you know something like a cloud is an awesome component from a money perspective, but just the architectural is like, okay, we're done. We can just turn off these you know 100 servers, and it's no big deal. We don't have to worry about having having lost anything. Great. Uh, which Hadoop uh, distribution do you use? We're using like a map or? distribution. Oh, okay. Great. I'm missing it. I have some more specifics on that one. I was going to grab that. Uh, I've got a colleague who looks primarily after cloud uh, our Hadoop cluster, but I see. Um, there we go. Sorry. Um, it's fine. Um, alas, I've lost track. Okay, so there's only one um, final question. I, I, I always ask this. Um, so when you come into work every day, what is the most important thing uh, for you to work on? I mean, every day, what is the most important thing you do? Or what are you about? That's a good question. Uh, and I think I have to answer this with a lesson that I learned from one of my bosses at Amazon, and that is as a, as a leader, as a manager, the most important thing that I do is that I build the right team for the company. I build the right team to get the job done. And so um, the most important thing for me to do when I come in every day is make sure I've got the right leaders under me, uh, that they've got the right leaders and engineers under them. Uh, because with the right team, all the other things like availability, hitting your dates, getting stuff done, building great technology for your customers, all that falls into place. If you don't have the right team, it's an uphill battle to get there. Oh, excellent answer. And um, thanks a lot, Ted, for your time today. And we learned a lot of interesting things about how you've scaled your system and team. Um, all the best to you. Um, Great. Thank you. you know, with, well, thanks for having thank me. You. And I, I had fun. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks, Ted. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.